If I could travel back into time, this is the place I would visit. The Library of Alexandria at its height 2,000 years ago. Here, in an important sense, began the intellectual adventure which has led us into space. All the knowledge in the ancient world was once within these marble walls. This library was a citadel of human consciousness, a beacon on our journey to the stars. And what did they study? They studied everything, the entire cosmos. But the treasure of the library, consecrated to the god Serapis, built in the city of Alexander, was its collection of books. Accurate numbers are difficult to come by, but it seems that the library contained at its peak nearly one million scrolls. What happened to all those books? Well, the classical civilization that created them disintegrated. The library itself was destroyed. Only a small fraction of the works survived. And as for the rest, we are left only with pathetic, scattered fragments. Let me tell you about the end. It's a story about the last scientist to work in this place, a mathematician, astronomer, physicist, and head of the school of Neoplatonic philosophy in Alexandria. That's an extraordinary range of accomplishments for any individual in any age. Her name was Hypatia. She was born in this city in the year 370 AD. This was a time when women had essentially no options. They were considered property. Nevertheless, Hypatia was able to move freely, unselfconsciously, through traditional male domains. By all accounts, she was a great beauty. And although she had many suitors, she had no interest in marriage. The Alexandria of Hypatia's time by then long under Roman rule, was a city in grave conflict. Slavery, the cancer of the ancient world, had sapped classical civilization of its vitality. The growing Christian church was consolidating its power and attempting to eradicate pagan influence and culture. Hypatia stood at the focus, at the epicenter of mighty social forces. Cyril, the bishop of Alexandria, despised her, in part because of her close friendship with the Roman governor, but also because she was symbolized. She was a symbol of learning and science, which were largely identified by the early church with paganism. In great personal danger, Hypatia continued to teach and to publish until, in the year 415 AD, on her way to work. She was set upon by a fanatical mob of Cyril's followers. They dragged her from a chariot, tore off her clothes, and flayed her flesh from her bones with abalone shells. Her remains were burned, her works obliterated, her name forgotten. Cyril was made a saint. The last remains of the library were destroyed within a year of Hypatia's death. It's as if an entire civilization had undergone a sort of self-inflicted radical brain surgery, so that most of its memories, discoveries, ideas, and passions were irrevocably wiped out. History full of people who, out of fear or ignorance or the lust for power, have destroyed treasures of immeasurable value, which truly belong to all of us. We must not let it happen again. We were, at long last, beginning to find our true bearings in the cosmos. The scientists of antiquity took the first and most important steps in that direction before their civilization fell apart. But after the Dark Ages, it was by and large the rediscovery 
of the works of these scholars done here that made the Renaissance possible and thereby powerfully influenced our own culture. When in the 15th century, Europe was at last ready to awaken from its long sleep, it picked up some tools, the books, and the concepts laid down here more than a thousand years before. By 1600, the long forgotten ideas of Aristarchus had been rediscovered. Johannes Kepler constructed elaborate models to understand the motion and arrangement of the planets, the clockwork of the heavens. His principal scientific tools were the mathematics of the Alexandrian library and an unswerving respect for the facts, however disquieting they might be. Seventy years later, the sun-centered universe of Aristarchus and Copernicus was widely accepted in the Europe of the Enlightenment. The idea arose that the planets were worlds governed by laws of nature, and scientific speculation turned to the motions of the stars. The clockwork in the heavens was imitated by the watchmakers of Earth. Precise timekeeping permitted great sailing ship voyages of exploration and discovery which bound up the earth. This was a time when free inquiry was valued once again. 250 years later, the earth was all explored. New adventurers now looked to the planets and the stars. Galaxies were recognized as great aggregates of stars, island universes, millions of light years away. In the 1920s, astronomers had begun to measure the speeds of distant galaxies. They found that the galaxies were flying away from one another. To the astonishment of everyone, the entire universe was expanding. We had begun to plumb the true depths of time and space. The long collective enterprise of science has revealed a universe some 15 billion years old. We on Earth have just awakened to the great oceans of space and time from which we have emerged. We are the legacy of 15 billion years of cosmic evolution. We have a choice. We can enhance life and come to know the universe that made us, or we can squander our 15 billion year heritage in meaningless self-destruction. What happens in the first second of the next cosmic year depends on what we do here and now with our intelligence and our knowledge of the cosmos.